Great. Um, just a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. Um, a, a few slides on how hypothesis works. I know some of you are very familiar with it. Um, a little bit about um, integrating um, hypothesis in your platform. Uh, what we kind of refer to as supported hypothesis, which includes the group functionality. Um, a quick look at the eLife um, integration uh, and a walkthrough that our designer put together that will show you some of the options um, when it comes to publisher group. And then as Nate said, um, we should have some time for a Q&A at the end. Um, first, as, as many of you may already know, um, Hypothesis is a mission-driven not-for-profit. Um, we are open source um, and we're strong believers in open standards. Um, some of the names that you see across the bottom of the screen are our uh, partners who have um, generously supported us over the years. Um, we're in the process of a transition, a five-year transition to earned income, and part of that is is working with publishers. We worked for um, a few years with the W3C to get annotation approved as a web standard, uh, which happened almost exactly a year ago today um, with an extremely high number of votes. Uh, what that will mean is in future versions of web browsers, just like you tell your browser what your default search engine is today, you'll be able to tell your browser which annotation client you're using. And um, in future, if every annotation client works in accordance with the standard, um, interaction between uh, annotation clients should be possible in the same way that we can email each other today, even though we might use different uh, email clients. Um, we're currently at uh, 2.7 million annotations and counting. We crossed 2.7 million this week. Um, I need to update our graphic there a little bit. Um, you can see here that about a quarter of the annotations have been made um, that are completely public. Um, the those completely public annotations are contributed to the Crossref event data project, so they're indexed by Google and discoverable. Um, a high number of annotations are made um, as part of collaboration groups, and we're very curious to see as the new groups for publishers uh, rolls out, um, what percentage of annotations might be made in that sort of a, a forum as well. Just a quick snapshot um, uh, recently of the different um, user sessions uh, and where folks are coming in from around the world. Um, probably not surprisingly, there's a high number of English language speaking countries represented at the top, the United States, United Kingdom, uh, India, Australia, Canada. Um, but you can see uh, across the board there just with the top 30 that we've got nearly every geographical region in the planet represented um, in quite a number of languages. So if you go in and explore um, the public facing annotations and hypothesis, you'll quite commonly come across annotations in Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, uh, French, Spanish, um, Hebrew, and more. Just a few slides on how hypothesis works. Um, we believe in layers of annotation, as I mentioned, built on open standards. So what that means is on top of the content, um, and annotations do live in line uh, with the text um, that the annotator is referring to, you can have multiple conversations going on um, on that same piece of content. You could have a, uh, a conversation going on in the public layer. Um, uh, in the private space, uh, Mr. Johnson's science class could be working on a collaboration project together. You could have a designated um, layer that's reserved for experts um, in the community. For example, the scientists that we work with at Climate Feedback, who fact check news articles um, in regards to climate change. Uh, and publishers are also looking at annotation as an additional uh, mechanism to distribute information about content. We'll show a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, one thing that's great about Hypothesis is you can annotate anywhere. Um, you can annotate in the major, major digital formats, um, HTML, PDF, and EPUB, as well as many kinds of data. And there is equivalent across um, those formats. So annotations that you make on the HTML would typically appear on the PDF and vice versa. Um, if you are a publisher that has your content on multiple platforms, let's say you work with um, PubMed Central, for example, or you work with aggregators like ProQuest and EBSCO, uh, annotations made uh, in one place on your content should be connected to um, annotations on, on content that's held elsewhere. There's a variety of different ways um, that we do that. Uh, canonical URLs, um, looking for tags in the metadata uh, that refer to DOIs, as well as PDF fingerprints. Just a bit about integrating hypothesis. Um, the basic implementation is free. 
Um, as many of you know, if you're uh, a researcher, you can come to our website um, at Hypothesis and get a free account today. Um, we've got a plugin um, and browser uh, bookmarklets that cover the major browsers, um, and that's free, of course, to use. Similarly, if you're a publisher or a platform host, um, you can do a no-cost um, integration of the basic hypothesis into your platform. It includes all the primary annotation capabilities. We have a number of plugins, as I mentioned, if you want to embed hypothesis in your site. Um, just a few of them mentioned here. There's a complete list um, available uh, on our site, and we've spent um, a lot of time the last year um, working with the different platform hosts uh, mentioned here and some others that will be announced soon to um, enable smaller publishers who are using those platforms uh, to get going with Hypothesis. We also have a very robust um, API um, that you can get started with today. Um, there's a number of uh, pieces of information uh, and things that you can do with the API. We believe very strongly that users should be able to get their annotations out um, and that publishers and other entities um, that want to make use of their annotations should be able to do so readily, whether they want to repurpose um, on their website, say in a widget for marketing purposes or to use for text and data mining. Um, uh, Nate's gonna be including some, some links to our documentation. And if you've got questions about it, we're happy to answer those today as well. Um, what if you want something that's a little bit more custom? Um, as we started to work with publishers um, a couple of years back, uh, publishers let us know that if they would enable by default uh, annotation to be visible on their platform, it seemed that by association those annotations um, would be connected to their, to their content. Um, so uh, enabling uh, branded layer um, that a publisher could moderate uh, was work that we undertook uh, for eLife. Um, we enabled a number of customizations uh, to allow the client to fit more readily with a publisher platform. Um, and we've got some other things um, that I'll talk to you about in just a second here. Um, when it comes to pricing, we typically use a number of documents that you want to deploy Hypothesis across um, as a proxy for publisher size. Uh, you can deploy Hypothesis as narrowly or as broadly as you like. Uh, you can put it on uh, one journal title, for example. You could put it on even, even one book. You could put it across your entire platform. The proxy size, um, when we ask you the number of documents you add per year, that does include um, adding Hypothesis back to volume one, issue one, so it includes back files. It's just um, the mechanism that we use um, to, to proxy um, publisher size. Um, we can also uh, connect to publisher existing accounts if that's something that uh, you're interested in. Um, and what we're going to be focusing on today in a little bit more detail is the technology that we call publisher groups. Again, um, these are branded and they can be precisely configured to meet publisher needs. Um, they can be uh, restricted where uh, public, they're publicly readable annotations, but the only folks who can create annotations in those layers are those invited and, and, and allowed to by the publisher. Um, there are also general discussion um, layer opportunities where annotations are publicly readable and basically um, anyone in the world can join and create um, those, uh, those annotations. Um, when it comes to UI, we've got um, a number of things that you can do, and some of them I'll show you on the eLife um, implementation. Um, you can control the colors um, of the client and the text, um, the information about the borders, different typefaces so that it will fit um, with your content, um, some default uh, measurements for the sidebar, uh, whether it will be open or closed, um, some configurability around highlights, as well as, as different calls to action so that you can let readers know that annotation is available on your site. Um, we think uh, very much at Hypothesis about how annotation can be successful. So we always meet with our publishers ahead of time to talk about what types of um, goals publishers are trying to achieve in enabling annotation and how that success um, can be measured. We offer a variety of different types of training uh, internal to the publisher aimed at end users, as well as um, dedicated training for folks like editorial board members who kind of sit in between. We feel that, you know, with internal as well as external champions, um, annotation will be a stronger um, success uh, on your platform. Um, these programs were working around engaging key annotators. Um, 
uh, some uh, things that have been tried successfully in the past by partners include um, putting together annotation events, uh, annotate-a-thons, you might say, um, enabling author annotations as part of regular workflow, or inviting an expert commentary. Um, we can work with you to coordinate our promotion, um, both when you sign, when the publisher groups launch. We'd love to present together with you at conferences and even put together case studies and white papers on different types of uses. Um, as an open source um, and nonprofit, um, support and open source maintenance are critical to our future success. Um, many of our partners are in this space as well. So we need to be able to provide um, to our partners um, technical support. Um, we've got a great support engineer who recently started with us. Um, we have an open source code base that's available for a deeper technical dive uh, and a community that's working on annotation capabilities across the board. Um, we're also, um, as I mentioned before, keenly dedicated to standards and interoperability. So we're working with a number of open tool providers and platforms uh, to enable that. Um, and we believe strongly in uh, annotation as a community effort. In 2015, we started the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition. It's a group that currently consists of more than 70 publishers, platform hosts, and technical companies um, dedicated to supporting an annotation ecosystem and trying out new projects together. We also host um, the iAnnotate Conference, which will be coming up the first week of May this year um, in San Francisco or sorry, the first week of June, it's usually the first week of May, uh, and we'll be um, putting together a partner event, having two full days of presentations around different um, types of annotation, as well as a hack day. Um, and we'll be happy to tell you um, to more about that. We recently uh, posted the registration page and we'll be doing a, a formal call for proposals. Um, we'd love to have you participate. Now I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen here for a second and go over into, uh, actually I can, I'm right here in the tab, go over and show you a little bit about the eLife integration. Um, if you wanna come back later and explore aspects of the eLife integration um, yourself, you can certainly um, do that. Um, the links that I'm gonna be going to now are available as part of the blog post that we did a few weeks ago. And if you go to this blog post on our website and scroll down, there are links um, to um, a couple of uh, articles that eLife has preceded with annotations. Um, so you can go ahead and check out um, what's been done so far in the platform. Now we'll pop over and I can tell you a little bit more about the integration that was done there. So um, first you may notice that the sidebar looks a little bit different um, in the eLife integration. These are the customizations um, that I mentioned. If I scroll up to the top, um, eLife wanted to streamline what's visible in the client, um, and this is in keeping with their minimalist approach on their new website. You can see it looks, uh, looks beautiful here. Um, they also wanted to change the call to action a little bit. So you can see now that I've closed to the client. Um, it's not visible here on the left, but you can explore annotations by clicking on an annotation tab here. Um, and you can also, if you go down a little bit further, click on um, this little conversation bubble. Um, similarly, if you want to start annotating, you can actually select um, text and the annotation tools um, will appear. Um, eLife um, has, is an example of using uh, publisher accounts um, to provide annotation to readers. So that means that um, anyone who comes to eLife who has an eLife profile can just start annotating. They don't need to create a separate um, hypothesis account. Um, so if you do want to play around with this on the eLife platform, have your ORCID handy and create yourself a nifty um, eLife uh, profile. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, take part yourself. Um, if I open up the annotations here, you'll see that first time annotators get a little getting started pain so um, this, they can get going. Uh, the way that um, eLife has worked with some of this content is to have the authors um, do some annotations to kick things off. So you can take a look here at and see what um, Xavier um, has provided uh, here in regards to his article. Um, eLife editors have also provided some brief information in the form of page notes. So page notes are annotations that are tied to the entire document rather than um, one piece of text within it. So check those out as well. If we look, uh, if we scroll down a little bit, um, we can see that um, in addition to Xavier's annotations, we've got some feedback um, from um, some folks who are reading the annotation here. 
Um, I've got another example that I can show you that has got um, a number of annotations. Whoops, my page is timed out, so let me give that um, a second to reload. It's, we're really curious to see, um, you know, how things are going with eLife, and we're right in the middle of um, doing a, 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 an awareness campaign with them that um, I'm sure Nate would be happy to tell you a little bit more about. Um, so while my page um, reloads, you'll be able to see here again my annotation tab. So here we have um, another author um, who's provided annotations, Benjamin Engel. Um, he's got some great links to additional resources. Um, there's some other folks who are weighing in here um, about the discovery. And similar to the other article, there's information provided here um, by eLife about the content. So uh, just an example of what eLife is doing. Um, I've got one more um, quick uh, thing to show you before we open up to questions. And to do that, I just need to stop sharing for a second while I swap over to a different application. Let me be right back. Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple more things that are possible. Um, so this is a walkthrough that uh, demonstrates the group's functionality that our designer put together for us. Um, I mentioned that, I uh, showed you that eLife has their call to action. It, one of them is a tab that you can click on. It's also very simple to put um, a button on your platform that will show the number of annotations um, on a given piece of content or a call to action like annotate PDF or annotate me. It's very customizable um, how you would like that to appear. Once a user clicks on, oops, let me go into my slide share so it's a little bit more, a little cleaner for you here. Once a user um, clicks on the button, then, uh, whoops, hang on here. Sorry, having trouble getting this to advance. Okay, maybe we're not gonna do it in the slide share mode. Um, once you click on the button, then the client will pop open uh, from the side. And you can see that this is the publisher branded layer. Um, it's got the little Biopub logo there and the, it's got a general discussion layer. Um, this first uh, piece of the walkthrough is, uh, indi indicates the connection to publisher accounts. So what you can see here is that these Annotations are world readable, just as in the eLife example. But if you want to create annotations, um, you're directed to either create an account or a login. Um, in this case, um, which it's referencing publisher account. So if you go ahead and log in there, you'll see you got to get started, getting started pane, similar to what we saw on the eLife platform. So eLife has one um, publisher layer that's intended for general discussion. But one of the cool things that I mentioned in the presentation is the publishers can actually have multiple layers atop their content. Um, this is um, covered as part of the pricing policy that we have. So you can have an unlimited number of, of layers for different purposes on your content. So we've got here a general discussion layer, um, which I'll show you next and then a couple of layers that are restricted for specific purposes. Uh, for example, um, authors annotating their own work or uh, peer review summaries or reviewer content. You could also use this if you wanted um, to add as a publisher information on how your content um, you know, might be used, new features, if you have any um, automated uh, entity annotations, um, you, know, you might make that visible in a separate layer as well. So for each one of these layers, you have the opportunity to view activity. Um, so we can go in and see what the um, activity page looks like. So this is a way that an end user can see what other content on the site has been annotated. They can explore what other annotators are doing, take a look at what tags have been applied. They can see um, different articles that have been annotated. And this um, general discussion um, activity page can be set as narrowly or as broadly as a publisher wants. It could be deployed across one book, it could be deployed across one journal, a collection of journals with a similar subject area, or across the entirety of your site, or even if you have multiple platforms um, across that as well. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a, it's a great way for folks to discover um, other content that is of interest um, to annotators on your platform. Um, we'll be sharing this presentation with you afterwards. It's just got a couple of um, slides here on how you um, highlight and create annotations.
And I want to show you a little bit about restricted layers. So for example, if a, if a user clicks on um, the layer that's indicated for reviews, they get a message that the group is read only. So they can see the annotations that have made here by reviewers. Um, and uh, there'll be an information page which explains um, the criteria for annotating in the group. Um, we get a lot of questions about using um, regular hypothesis accounts, and so I should stress that publishers who integrate hypothesis do not have to use their own accounts. Many of our publishers do not even have account systems or profile systems of their own, so they're um, happy to use um, regular hypothesis accounts. And you can still have the publisher branded and moderated layer, even if it's run in the back end with hypothesis accounts. There's just an additional step um, when the user wants to create annotations, they just need to create a hypothesis account first. So um, if you are currently um, annotating on eLife, for example, using their accounts, and you want to switch to your regular hypothesis account, you can just log out of eLife. Um, but what we want to make it easier for users to do is to actually connect and bridge between the publisher account and the regular hypothesis account. So this um, uh, flow is intended to demonstrate that. So you could actually log into your hypothesis account and be logged into both. Um, this is some work we're going to be completing um, in the, the next couple of months. Um, so you can see here that now that I'm logged into both accounts, I can see the publisher authoritative layers by default at the top, but I can also see that there are annotations in the public layer, as well as a private annotation group, Neuro Club, that I'm a part of. So I can um, direct my annotation to whichever um, layer is appropriate in that case. So this has um, uh, been just an example of a walkthrough of different possibilities um, that you can do if you're enabling a uh, publisher branded and moderated layer. Um, that's the end of the planned presentation and we're happy to take any questions now. Hey Heather, uh, it's been a pretty quiet group so far. Um, Suzanne also joined us as we were going along. Um, you know, we have such a small group of folks too, we could also turn on audio if you even want to have a voice conversation. Sure. Um, August, Suzanne, Gitna, do you have uh, stuff that you'd like to ask about or would you like to describe how you're thinking about annotation at your institution and we could talk about how hypothesis might fit in? Okay, Yitna says yes. Let's see if I can allow to talk. Wow. Okay, um, Yitna, I'm promoting you to a panelist so you can talk. So if you have audio, Yitna, you should be able to. Yeah, say I see you're muted. If you can just click on the little microphone on the lower left, you should be able to unmute yourself. Or maybe I can do that. And August, we see your question, and we will um, we will get to that too. Yeah, Nick, can you try? Speaking? Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm interested, of course, in in the um, connection with the learning management system at our institution, uh, which is Sakai, uh, and we're interested in an LTI connection. I noticed you do have something going on with Canvas. I don't know if the processes are the same for the two. Uh, if not, what would it take to, uh, to effect a, a, an LTI connection for a Sakai-based uh, learning management system? Do you want hey. me to take that one, Heather? Sure, go ahead. So, you know, as you may remember, I'm a, an old erstwhile <laughs> Sakai community member. Um, so the good news is that um, we took the beta work that we did in Canvas um, and LTI connection there and are now um, working with uh, an outside team of developers actually to extend that LTI integration into any other standards compliant LMS, which would include Sakai, of course, thanks to Dr. Chuck, um, so that there will at least be um, basic integration capabilities between Hypothesis and an LTI compliant LMS like Sakai. Wow, that was hard to say. Um, the the first the first thing, of course, is to get the um, the hypothesis client embedded into the LMS, um, 
And then the second is, uh, which most people have earmarked as the most important feature, is so that there's single sign-on and rostering capabilities that cross between, you know, the course or, or uh, project sites in the LMS like Sakai and Hypothesis so people don't have to make new accounts. Be happy to hear about other, other thoughts you have on, on the integration. Um, I don't have other thoughts. I was a bit surprised when you said uh, you, you would need to um, integrate Hypothesis into the LMS first. The LTI connection would not be enough. In other words, would there be work has to be done on the Sakai LMS structure, or is it just strictly the LTI connection that is already built into our system? It, it, should, it should all work with just an LTI connection. In fact, I've done some preliminary testing on what we have already, and uh, the LTI connection is working. There's a couple of bugs that need to be worked out, um, but it should, the, the goal is, is definitely to make it all work with Sakai's standard LTI capabilities. Um, oh, and that would be uh, either at the, uh, the full implementation level or at a particular course or project site level. I see. Okay. Uh, it would be good to be able to do it at the particular uh, course level. We work with other vendors that use LTI and the biggest weakness is that they, they just make the simple connection and don't really respond to our course structures. Um, so hopefully we, we can create something more uh, flexible usable by courses. So that's our interest. Yeah, and that's where the, the um, single sign-on and rostering integration I think is, is crucial so that um, one of the common practices with hypothesis, and this uh, kind of um, matters in the publisher use case too, is that often if you have a course or any group of people like a, a journal club or, um, or a group of um, peer reviewers or any kind of editorial function on the publishing side, they often want to annotate together in a group structure. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've long had what we call the private groups, which uh, a lot of educators have made use of because the teachers and students can work together privately, as Heather mentioned. And so um, one of the goals of the LTI integration is to make it so that the course roster in an LMS like Sakai is automatically put into a private group structure and hypothesis so they can annotate together, which doesn't mean you couldn't do public annotation too if you wanted to, but the assumption is, is that most people will want to be annotating in a, in a course environment in a, in a private group structure. That makes perfect sense. Great. Well, so we should, the goal is to have that um, LTI integration capability ready so that it, it would be available even before fall 2018. Um, and knowing how academic calendars work, we know that you really need it in the spring sometime in order to think about using it for the fall. So um, how well you know us. <laughs> yes, I know you all too well. Um, and so uh, stay tuned. I'm sure you know our colleague, Dr. Jeremy Dean. Mm -hmm. And so he is leading point, obviously, in all the education work. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be doing updates. He'll be leading some, as soon as we have something juicy to show, he'll, of course, be leading webinars in that as well. Um, but the, there are people working on it as we speak. So that's cool. I have one more quick question. Sure. Uh, um, you, in using it uh, with students at this, this semester, I've noticed that, um, the interactions, the replies, uh, are not listed in with the, I'm not sure what the term is that, that when you click on somebody's uh, ID, you get a list of their uh, annotations, but you're only getting the top level, you're not getting the interactions. I realize it's a complex thing to, to uh, solve, but have, have you guys thought about that or done anything to, to be able to show the actual discussion rather than just the top level uh, posting? Uh, yeah, so you've 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 recognized something that's a well-known issue, of course, and that that area we talk about is the the user profile area, or sometimes we call it activity pages, where you can browse and search through any um, any kind of faceted group of annotations, including those of a particular user. And you're right; right now, replies are not returned automatically into that uh, into that view, and so we uh, we understand that that's a that's a drawback and. It's not even as complicated as you have, you have pointed it out. So we are 
Um, we've already done prototypes where it's, it's included and we recognize that as a key thing that needs to move forward. So you should also see that in this spring time frame. Time frame. Well, I lost my ability to talk there. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, and so we have another question from August who had asked, um, have you thought about the overlap between Crossmark and Hypothesis for post-pub updates? That seems like a Heather question. Yeah, um, actually it's, it's one of the very first use cases that I thought about for Hypothesis. I think even before I um, was officially part of the, the company and I'm reminded of it whenever I see that there's a correction that eLife article um, that I showed had the red banner across the top indicating that there, that there had been a, a correction. Um, I think it would be great. I've had a couple of quick calls, you know, with uh, Ed Pence um, at, at Crossref to kick things off. It's probably probably due for a check-in with him. Um, anytime you want to add additional information, uh, doing it through the form of an annotation um, is, is one way to do it. Uh, folks who don't know, for example, to click on a, a cross mark to get an update um, might never know um, that something uh, you know, has been done. Um, also, we're doing some work with the American Diabetes Association uh, that they're implementing one of the restricted layers um, to do updates on their um, annual standards of care issue. And so it's critical to them that just ADA staff be able to, to do that. But one of the things that um, we've also had in discussion is using um, annotation cards to make updates and corrections more visible. So you could connect an article um, through an annotation card in line with um, its update or correction. Um, and similarly, if someone comes across the DOI for the update or correction, um, connect that uh, back to the original article. In some instances, um, it, it's a good way to indicate to readers who might be starting their, um, their research online, but who may in a hospital setting, for example, still be looking at a, at a print journal at some point to let them know that something's been corrected in the online edition um, that they need to you know, take care of um, when, they, when they look at the print. Um, but yeah, any kind of um, identifier like Crossmark is an excellent use case. We seem to have stunned them into silence. Um, August and Suzanne, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? We don't have to stay the whole time, of course, um, but we're happy to talk more. I can also promote you so you can use your voice if you'd prefer. Any other questions, thoughts, suggestions, ideas? Uh, is the microphone still on for me? It is, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, any thoughts on um, media annotation besides text, um, images, video, things like that, other, other kind of media? One, um, sorry, Heather, I was just jumping on this. Uh, we, we definitely have earmarked image and video and audio annotation as a, as a future thing to focus on. We're trying, we're, right now we're still focused on making sure that text annotation is widely supported across, across all pr platforms and formats like EPUB was just added mm -hmm. over this last fall. There has been some, our colleague John Udell, who you may know, uh, has mm -hmm. been doing some really interesting work in the annotation of the textual transcripts that accompany video and actually audio as well. Um, and I can point you to a couple of blog posts about it. Um, he's published some of it on, on the Hypothesis blog, but he's also done some of it on his, um, his personal blog. And so I will, um, I will dig those up for you and put them in the chat. Um, so it's, it's not quite video annotation, but it comes pretty close because it's a way to annotate the textual transcript, which one would want to have for a variety of reasons anyway. Um, and have it be synced to the timeline of the video audio piece. Wow. You, you want to add something, Heather? Nope, that's a great overview. So I will dig, I will dig that uh, those uh, up for you, Yitna, and you will get um, a, a list of links in the email kind of uh, synopsis of the webinar as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we might have, uh, we might have answered that. Oh, you muted yourself, Nate. Oops, right while I was talking. That's a good idea. I, I know other people who want to have that power over me as well. 
I could just shut him up, that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you guys um, so much uh, for, for joining today. Um, as Nate mentioned, the recording will be available um, for if you have colleagues that were not able to join. Um, and we'll also make the, um, the walkthrough presentation that I just show um, uh, available. Um, I also uh, should mention, and, and we, we can include this as part of the follow-up, Nate, that we've launched a little uh, test site um, on our uh, fictitious publisher here, Biopub, um, that um, just gives a, an initial um, you know, snapshot into these, these open groups, which again is the world readable and, and, and world writable groups. Um, and as, as the restricted groups um, become, uh, on, go online in the next few weeks, um, you know, I think we'll be adding that to the test site as well. So if you want to go uh, take a look at that, um, you'll be able to play around a little bit. I do encourage you to take a look at the integration that eLife has done. Um, and just a reminder that uh, to do so, you need to create an eLife account um, and uh, have your ORCID ready. I hope everyone on this call, you know, has an ORCID. Um, they're, they're big uh, supporters of, of Hypothesis and we're in turn big supporters for them. So we feel everyone should, um, should have that. And um, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me or Nate or, or anyone on the team and um, look for some announcements in the next couple of um, weeks and months of uh, new publisher integrations that are going to be coming out.